Hi everyone, welcome to the Inside Jobs season finale. This week we have a very special guest, a British classically trained actor and award winning writer. He was thrust into the mainstream after landing a leading role as Ravi Roy in one of the UK's biggest and most popular TV shows, Hollyoaks. After starring in a number of British movies, he appeared in The Mummy, starring Tom Cruise and Russell Crowe in 2017, shortly before the release of his first film as a writer and producer, Abe, which you can now watch on Amazon, iTunes and Google Play. It was screened at the BAFTAs and received the prestigious Williams Byrne Bursary Award at the Triforce Short Film Festival 2017. In this episode, we are given a behind-the-scenes look at the challenges and triumphs of the entertainment industry and the importance of being a jack-of-many-trades. Introducing Stephen Uppel. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the season finale of The Inside Job. I could not think of a better way to end this season than with this person. He is a British classically trained actor and award-winning writer who was thrust into the mainstream after landing a leading role as Ravi Roy in one of UK's biggest and most popular TV show, Holly Oaks. He then moved on to star in a number of British movies, and by 2017, he was globally recognized, appearing in films such as The Mommy Starring Tom Cruise and Russell Crowe, and that same year released his first and award-winning short film as writer and producer, Abe, in which he also played the lead. Nowadays, he's busy promoting two upcoming films, Beyond Therapy and Seller. And if that's not enough, he's busy preparing for the release of his upcoming TV pilot, Damned. Please join me in welcoming none other than Mr. Stephen Wow, you made me sound awesome. <laughs> That's a lot. It's so weird. You are, because you are, because you are awesome. I do That's want to awesome. mention also that we are doing the show a little bit different since it's our season finale. See, you already started with your whiskey. Yeah. I was going to get white wine, but I decided to put my big girl panties on and I got. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Virtual cheers. I'm, I'm not sure how good this is, but it's, uh, I think, 18 years old, and it's Highland Park. Nice. Good, no, good? That, that, that's okay, good. Okay, because Declan loves his whiskey, a nice, good Scottish whiskey. Yeah. And I have these eyes that don't melt, the little black eyes. Whiskey stones, yeah, I've got whiskey exactly stones. the stones in there. Can you, can yeah. you see them, guys? Yeah, I if see it. You don't it. want to put ice in there. They're, they're, they're pretty good. I mean, they don't really cool down the whiskey that much, but it you, you don't lose the flavor with it being watered down. So, But that's a northern size portion, as you can see. That probably costs like 650 quid if you went to a bar. <laughs> but that, I'm joking. It wouldn't really. Um, no, but it would be expensive. <laughs> I know it would be expensive, but yeah, see, I tried it. I just took a sip. I already feel really, really warm on the inside. Yeah. So that tells me that it's good whiskey. Yeah. That's it. That's <laughs> yeah. Exactly how it should be. Yeah. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, you know, you received much recognition for your short film, which, by the way, was the first one, Abe. Um, I believe we have a clip. Let, let's take a look. sure about this?
So we just took a look at Abe, um, the BAFTA screened award-winning short film. And I got a chance to watch this film. I actually watched it twice. It was uh. that good. And, you know, I've got to say that the film to me, it was thought provoking and so powerful in so many ways. What was your inspiration behind this film? Um, wow, yeah. So it, it came from two places mainly, well, three places actually. So place number one was a place of ego and desperation. So I'll talk about that first. At, the, at this, this time in my life, things weren't going very well at all in terms of my career. I'd graduated from drama school eight years previous and flew. Like I, I went from job to job to job. Um, I think in eight years I had two months off. That's unprecedented for a job in ACTA. It's like there's always vast and long periods of being out of work and not knowing where your next job's coming from. So I got really complacent and quite egotistical because even though I was a very hard working guy and, and always professional, I, I began to think, oh, this is easy. My agent gets me an audition. I audition, I turn up, well prepared, I'm going to get the job. By the time we got to Abe, I'd been out of work for three years. And mm -hmm. that's fine. That's fine because you, as an actor, you are prepared for those. You, you, you're told at drama schools and stuff, you know, you're going to be out of work more than you are in work. Even if you're as successful as uh, the Leonardo DiCaprio's of the world, they've still spent less time on set than they have in life. But what I wasn't expecting was to not even get the opportunity to audition. I went three years without a single casting for whatever reason. I'm, I'm a big believer in karma and the universe, but for whatever reason at the time, nobody wanted to see me, whether I was right for roles or, or not. I just couldn't get an audition. Wow. So I sank into a, a massive depression thinking, oh God, like I come from a, a, a fighting family, so I've got a, a, like a, a fighter's background. I can't fight for Toffee, but I know how to fight. If you know what, I don't, don't like it, but I like the sport. Um, yeah. So I, I was in this massive hole, this depressed place going, oh, it's not fair, you know, blaming the world for, for, for me being in this predicament, going, if I don't get the chance to spar, i.e. if I don't get the chance to audition, how, how am I ever going to get the chance to fight? So I was like, really just the world is against me and all that stuff. Do, do you think that you were typecasted before why it was so hard? Honestly, I, I don't. It has something to do with it, but I don't believe in my case in particular, regardless of my ethnicity, that that was the case. I just believe, I'm a big believer in the universe. I believe the universe was saying, you've got a bit cocky, you've got complacent. This isn't the path we wanted you on because you've got lazy. So what we're going to do is we're going to test you and we're going to put you in a deep, dark hole, mm -hmm. one that you're going to struggle to get out of and we're going to see what you're made of, whether you can get out of it. And even though that, that time in my life at the time felt like the worst, like most depressing time in my life. I lost my brother, which I'll talk about as well as we go on. I lost my brother who was my hero, and um, which is um, number two of why I was inspired to write Abe. Number one is this, this not having, having the work. So I believe that um, that at the time felt like the worst time in my life. Like I just felt the world was against me, but looking back at it now, I am so thankful for that time because I grew you don't grow in life through when you're winning all the time. You just don't, you go, you grow through what you go through. So those hardships, if you, if you're willing to just dig in and, and fight your way through it, figure it out, there's going to be light at the end of that tunnel as cheesy as that sounds. And that's exactly what happened. So I believe it was a universe saying, look, dude, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, this, you're getting cocky. This isn't the human we wanted you to be. So we're going to take it all away from you and you're going to, you're going to hit bo rock bottom and you're going to start again. So it got to a point where I was like, okay, then fuck you world. I'm allowed, am I allowed to swear on this? <laughs> you just did. All right. Sorry. I was That's like, okay, go on. Like, fuck you world. I'll, I'll show you all. Fuck you agent. Fuck you. I went, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to start writing. I went, if I, if I, if I can't like, if I can't do it the traditional way and, and I've, learned that there is no traditional way there is no single way in this in this life to get to where you want to go you've just got to figure it out take inspiration and advice from wherever you can 
use it and go. So I, I started to write. Now, um, I recently lost my brother um, in back in 2012 from for drugs and and like he he was severely depressed and and had all these issues going on that I had no clue I was so ignorant to depression and things like that because of the way I was brought up wasn't a manly thing to do and my brother growing up was my idol he was like this very successful businessman he was this um, like he, he was a bit like a rock star in our little town of Middlesbrough everyone knew who he was he was a very like um he was in in those towns. If you're tough, if you can fight, you get a lot more respect as well. And he was he was known to be a very very hard lad in that town too. So so he had he had it all until he didn't, and then he sank into this massive depression. But he he brought me up to to be like man up man up man up. The worst phrase you can ever say to anyone. Don't show your emotions. Do you know it, it's it's a weakness. Man up man up. So obviously, as we got older and my career started to take off and he was like, I was doing Hollyoaks and things like that. Um, and he, he'd become a shell of a man. So I was then having a go and going, man, what are you doing? Do you know what? Like, you told me, you told me all this. You told me, man, now look at you, what are you doing? And God, it's, it's one of my biggest regrets in life because I didn't understand how crazy this brain is. And how fragile the mind is until I went through my own depression when he passed away and I went through that period of not working, um, splitting up with my fiance. All these, everything just happened at once and it was like, oh my God, like, I, like just, I don't want to get out of this bed. I literally do, I can't, I can't. Like, it's just, it's not worth it. Mm. So he was another source of inspiration. And inspiration number three was when I started to let go a little bit more and take more control of my own life. So I was like, okay, money's running out. I have to figure out another way of earning money. And I have to, um, I also want to help people and learn more about what's going on in my brain, this, this mental health and stuff. So I, that's when, like, I've always been a prolific reader, but it was always literature. I'm obsessed with Victorian and Shakespearean literature. But when this started happening, I got interested in philosophy and cognitive behavioral therapy and, and just learning from, from great minds. So I started volunteering at, um, in downtown Los Angeles at this homeless shelter for vulnerable adults called the Lamp Community. Mm. Um, and what's so great about communities is the majority of these um, homeless shelters, they'll only allow you to sleep there if you're not on any drugs or anything like that, which is ridiculous if you think about it, because especially in America, there's no medical insurance, there's no NHS. So these poor people, if they can't get hold of the drugs they need to balance the chemicals in the brain, they are going to self-medicate and it'll probably start with this and then go on to harder things because they're trying to escape. So the lamp accepted everybody because their philosophy was, well, how are they meant to, you know, medicate themselves and get off it if, if they, they don't get the opportunity to have the shelter? So I love that about them. So I started um, volunteering there and I met some incredible people. Again, my naivety was just like, oh, they're all just drug addicts and like, or they've been beaten up at home or, you know, abused or whatever it is. Um, and I met this one particular guy. I won't mention his name. No, it's okay. This is inspiration number three for the film. So number one was ego, being out of work. Number two was a, a massive oh. love for my brother and, and, mental illness and, and feeling that myself and experiencing depression myself. Number three was, was this guy at the homeless shelter. And every time like I'd be around him, cause I did various things like they like serving food and, and just sometimes I just wanted someone to talk to. So you'd just be there and as, as to play cards with them or just chat with them or whatever. And, and this guy was just so unique. He was so intelligent. And, you know, again, this is my prejudices, thinking that everyone who's homeless is, like, illiterate. It's, it's insane how we judge people straight away. Even if you're the nicest human on earth, it's a human condition that we judge before we, we understand and, and open up. And I was just talking to him, and I, and I just went, Look, I'll, tell me to go away if, if you want. But I, I just don't understand how someone who is as articulate as you are and is so, can, 
can end up in this situation. And he went, well, it's, it's very simple. And he was a multimillionaire, this guy. And he got cancer. And on his medical insurance, he paid all his taxes, was an incredible citizen, but on his medical insurance in the small print, he was only covered to a certain level of treatment. So basically, he spent the rest of his money, his entire fortune, over a period of like five years, beating cancer when he was, when he was told to die. And it, it, during that time, his wife left him and, and all this stuff. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. He went, don't be sorry for me. He went, dude, I'm alive. He went for the first, he went, money's easy. He went, if you, if you learn to do something before you can do it again. He went, I'm not even bothered about that. He went, almost dying made me realize how, impo- how like insignificant that, that thing is, which is kind of similar to what's going on now. We've all been leveled out with the coronavirus and, and yeah. coming back to what what is really important which is humanity which is stillness you know it all these things so this guy he went he went for the first time in my life i'm free he went with my wife and stuff he went i, I knew what i signed up for i knew she wanted she was with me. she was a trophy wife you know so he went it's on me he went i knew what the deal was he went i didn't expect anything different he went but for the first time in my life i'm free and I just want to be, I, even, I genuinely want to be here with no, no, like, no stress, no headaches. And then eventually, he went, I'll, I'll figure my way back up to where I want to be. He went, but I know one thing for certain, money will never be the driving force in my life again. He went, I'll, I'll earn enough to be able to give and enjoy, but not so much where it takes over my life. And, and I have to compromise being with friends. I have to compromise being with my children to earn money. He went, it's not worth it. And that's like, I don't want to give Abe away for any of your viewers who probably might want to watch it, but you can, after watching the film, you can understand now you know, yeah. where it came from. So, so that, sorry about the long-winded answer, but it needed, oh, no, it needed it. It's time for another. Yeah, but that was the... Um, <laughs> That was the inspiration, those three things behind the, the film. Oh, yeah, because when I was looking at the film, I lived in L.A. right before I met my husband, Declan. And so I was looking. I was like, is that downtown L.A.? I was trying to figure out. It was. I was, I was like, it looks like downtown L.A. Yeah, it was. Yeah, we. Uh, I can't remember exactly where we filmed, but the Lamb community is, it's on um, Skid Row. It's based yeah. around there. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so we found places in and around the area where we could film, and um, yeah, I mean, it was it was three years of my life. I lost five stone to um, do it. I grew out again. My hair and stuff's growing now because of this, but like I grew out all my hair and beard because couldn't really afford wigs and makeup and things like that. So yeah, had to do everything. No, I think um, Skid Row, you mentioned, because I used to work at the LA Times, which is right by Skid Row. And to me, it was always amazing, not in a good way, where one half of downtown LA was so expensive, ridiculously expensive. And then you just go a few blocks and it's like a cent or something. And it was just the most yeah. unkept area that you could ever live in. It's just like, it's one block or two blocks that separate an entire, a class. And I always thought that was so interesting. Really? And it was so sad also. Yeah. It, it is, and it's the same all over the world though. You always get pockets. I mean, look at London, for instance, you've got the affluent areas and right next door will be one of the poorest areas going. It's just crazy. It's crazy. Do you miss LA at all? Um, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. LA, the weather is beautiful. I, I love that. I loved um, my job and my, you know, my friends back there. And we were able to have a real happy hour. So once we're done working, the sun was still out. We would drive to Malibu or go to the beach on the weekend you know, Friday and um, or other times we would just finish work, park the car, take an Uber and go and have happy hours. So those, it was yeah. a lot of fun. And I lived in the heart of LA. So everything was just right there. You could just take a taxi, no big deal. Yeah. However, I felt like LA was more 
of uh, transitional relationships. So yeah. my core is from New York. I've, I'm born in Jamaica, but I grew up in New York. And wow, which I'm, part? Um, Brooklyn, and then we moved to Long Island. But I spent most of my childhood in Brooklyn, in Canarsie, in the Canarsie area. Wow, so, my sister lives in, uh, she's lived there 23 years. She lives in Manhasset on Long Island. Oh, so, okay, so she's a couple exits down from where we are now. We're in Valley Stream. Yeah, yeah, so I'm there, I'm there, there every other year. She's been there 23 years, so yeah, I am. Um, she I loves enjoy. it then, I take oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, she, she'll, she'll never come back. <laughs> married with children and stuff. But no, I agree with you. Um, that's, I lived in LA for four years. I felt exactly the same. Um, there's so many beautiful um, experiences to be had there, but it's too new a city. Um, yeah. So th th there's no, and, and this isn't any LA's fault, but for me, when you come from such a rich historical place, I miss that. I miss the history. I miss yeah. seeing buildings that are thousands of years old. Um, and I never thought I'd ever say this in my life, but I actually missed the seasons. I started to go, oh God, it's sunny again. I couldn't believe that. That's about it. I, I love the weather there. I'll take the no seasons. I just want it to snow during Christmas time, New Year's, yeah. and that's it. But it's true about the culture because I remember my first year, I stayed there for Thanksgiving. Never again. I was so sad. Like no one really celebrated it in new york you know where you stand it's either they love you or they don't in yeah. la everybody says i love you and let's do lunch and let's link up and whatever and it's not really real and yeah. to be fair it's a lot of the transplants you know that yep. and it's just just that one era because there are outskirts in the valley where people are a lot more friendly yeah and warm yeah, so. that's that's where I lived. I lived in Sherman Oaks. Oh, okay. Yeah, so like right there. Because I I had to look around West Hollywood and stuff like that. I went, I can't live here. Uh -uh. <laughs> like even even the Hollywood Hills and stuff. I had two pennies to rub together. But you still go, oh, I'll I'll have a look. And I looked at it. And I went, it's pretty, but I can't live here. Just I I just, it's just like. And I quickly realized. I went, oh, I thought that this was what I like where I saw myself living it because that's growing up. But I went, no, man, I want a beautiful house with acres of land on, on the river or on a big farm somewhere in London or on the outskirts of London. That's, that's like, but unless you go and explore these things, you never know. You never know what is, what is truly in your heart and what you need unless you go out there and explore. Well, I don't think that London will be our final destination. Because Declan loves that warm weather, so wouldn't be surprised if within the next few years we're actually out of here. Yeah. I'm yeah. thinking somewhere along the lines of Australia, something like that. Nice. Um, I hear the weather is really nice there. But, yeah. you know, speaking about your inspiration, how, how did you even come into this career? The acting. Um... So it's always been in me from a young age, but growing up in Middlesbrough, it's, it's, um, I love Middlesbrough. The majority of my family is still there. It's a small town in the northeast of England, um, and it's home. Like I go there as often as I can to see all my family. But it is, it's a tough place to grow up, especially in the 80s. I'm actually, if you can see that board behind me, I'm actually writing a TV show. I'm halfway through writing the pilot about my experiences growing up in this in this town. Um, being an actor and stuff, that you don't do that. There's two things you do in a town like that. And this is me being like quite stereotypical, but back then this is what it was. You you got a, a job as a trade, so an electrician or a plumber. If you did that, you've made it. And there's also the ones who did that, if they managed to get offshore. So to work on the oil rigs in the middle of the sea where you work for a minimum of two weeks. So you, you, you're just in the middle of the sea, um, no contact with anybody except your workmates. You work for two weeks, you come home for two weeks. If you've got that job, you're like a rock star in that little town. And the other option, um, the main option was drug dealer. Oh. They, they, were, 
they, 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 they were the two. And in between, you got the odd person who became a teacher or was fortunate enough to become a football player or a boxer. Nobody ever went into the... A lot more are now, but nobody ever did. I mean, there was a film 20 years ago, Billy Elliot, you know, which it kind of goes... And the, the kid who played Billy Elliot, Jamie Bell, he's from Middlesbrough. He's from a small town called uh, Billingham, just on the outskirts of Middlesbrough. Very famous actor now, very wealthy young young man. Um, and when he was growing up, like the character in Billy Elliot, he got tortured, he got bullied, beaten up all the time. Even when he got, when, when Billy Elliot came out, he was still going to school in Middlesbrough. And he, he couldn't after a while, because obviously young teenage boys start spitting on him and kicking him and battering him saying oh who do you think you are now you think you're this this and this so again it was never a thing that you did in my town but secretly I had a pang for it I was reading from a young age because my eldest sister is an English grew up to be an English teacher so she used to practice on me when she was younger she had me reading like Dickens and Chaucer when I was 12 years old by the age of seven, I was reading all of the Chronicles of Narnia books. And that wasn't like, oh, wow, look at me. It was because she invented and told me about these worlds. And I went, I want to know more. And this is why it's so important to get a good influence, a mentor in your life when you're young. And, and now I have mentors. Now I'm 41 years old. I still have mentors. And I'll have mentors till the day I die because you should never, ever stop learning. So eventually... I, I won't go into because that'd be a, like too long a, a show. I went through the, the crazy period of fighting, being on the dole, not knowing where I was, you know, going to clubs with my, with my mate, mates and trying to fit in. But there was something that was always missing. And it was that, but I didn't dare admit it. And then eventually when I got to a certain age, it was probably 20, I, um, I went crying to my sister. I'd had this huge fight in a, a nightclub. Uh, the Millennium Nightclub, me and a couple of my friends who I used to hang about with, um, and it was brutal. But we we won, but I had like a big, big gash where, where I'd been smashed in the face with a bottle. So I had a big gash across my face. I'll never forget this. This was a turning point in my life. Um, I was on the dole at the time. For those who don't know what the dole is, it's a benefit because I was out of work and, and I wasn't at, at university or anything. So it's where you get every two weeks, you've got to go to the job centre and go, oh, yeah, I've been looking for work. Um, here's a proof. Can I have my £80, please? And you go and I'd spend that in the pub. And I'll never forget because I was like feeling, oh, look, I'm a man, you know, this is because in that town, being able to fight gave you a reputation and, and things like that. And I'll never forget it. Um, I was in, so I hadn't been home all night. I was in this pub. I won't name the pub because I love the place, but at the time it was, was not a good place for me. And after a night out, that's where we'd all end up, like a stoppy back. If you've, if you've ever seen Seamus or anything like that, it's a it's similar thing. So we'd be all in there and still drunk, you know, still completely nutly drunk out of our faces, blood still all over our clothes from the night before. It was just, that was a normal night out in, Middlesbrough back then oh. um, and I can just remember feeling quite sick and then one of the older like guys who used to have a reputation who was my, my age now so 41 I won't again won't name his name he's been in and out of jail he, he's uh, he got acquitted of murder and things like this these these are not like not nice people and I can remember he came over and sat with us Again, he always did this every because he, he lived vicariously through us because that's what he used to do, do you know. And he he was a man of the town, so in this pub he always got free drinks. He never had to pay, and um, I can just remember looking at him as as he was telling this story that he told us since I, I've been going in this pub since I was fifteen years old, and it was the same story. And I just had this epiphany. I saw all the scars on his face and stuff. I went. That's, that's going to be me in 20 years' time. And I started, like, shaking and, and, and like, almost throwing up because I was like, I don't... I, I, like, almost, like, I didn't want to cry in front of them, but I was having a breakdown at, like... I was only probably 18, 19, something like that. And I can just remember going, I've got to go, boys. And everyone started laughing, going, ah, see you later, Uppel. Surname's Uppel, and that's... Everyone called you by his surname. See you later, Uppel's white in, which basically means he's having a... He's going to throw up, he's... 
Um, mm. Oh, all's waiting. I'll see you later. And I can remember get. I couldn't breathe. And I was like, and I can remember going home and uh, my mum looking at my face and going, are you all right? So I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. She said, okay, um, I'm just going to get some, do you want something to eat? I was like, yeah, yeah, no problem, mum, cheers. And then um, I can remember going to the toilet and then as I was going to the kitchen for something, because I thought she was in the kitchen, her, her door, her bedroom door was slightly open and she was in floods of tears. Oh, it's, it's killing me telling this now. She was crying her eyes out going, and, and I just thought, I did that to her. That's, she's crying because of me, because she just want, and I, and I can remember going to my older sister at the time who was like respectable, normal. She was teaching at the time and I just broke down and went, sis, help me. I went, please help me. I, I, I don't want to be like these people. Um, I'm pretending anyway, that isn't who I am. I just want to fit in. I want to fit in and, and be popular. And yeah, and then she took me to college for an induction, I was nervous. I stopped. It was easier to stop hanging about with people back then. There was no social media. There was no mobile phones. So for me to, for someone to actually come and see me, they'd either have to ring the landline oh, yeah. or they'd have to physically knock on your door. Um, so I cut all my ties, cut all my ties with that world. My sister got me enrolled in college and I started my A-levels and it all started from there. I started to build confidence. I had some great teachers. They went, you can do this, you know. It's like, really? They went, yeah, there's schools that you can you can audition for in London. I was like, but it's a rich man's game. I, my family can't afford to send me to a posh drama school. They went, you'll get a scholarship. I didn't even know things like that existed, grants and scholarships. They went, you'll get a scholarship. Um, I went, okay, I went, but I need to do a degree first for my mum. I've, I've let her down. All she's ever done is provide for me, look after me. I've let her down. I, I want to give give her something. So I went to uni and did an English degree. And at the same time, I was doing amateur dramatics. Do you know, I just got into a little club. From there, I auditioned for a school, um, multiple schools in London, and was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to go to my first choice. And I moved to London in 2005 to start a three-year course in, in professional acting and musical theatre. So that was basically my inspiration was I just always wanted to do it, but I just didn't have the courage, courage or the, the belief, which is very important, the belief that I could do it, or the people around me who could tell me that it was a possible thing until I stepped out my comfort zone, put that life behind me and, and, and went down, down this road and I've never looked back. Now, um, and we all know that acting, and you've kind of spoken about it before, you not getting any job for three years, that it's not the stablest of careers. Sometimes an actor can have multiple projects all at once, yeah. or years, months could go by, and nothing on the horizon. What's the driving force for you staying in acting, and how do you cope with the lows? This, this is an amazing question because it, it doesn't matter what you do when you're in work constantly. It counts when you're out of work. That's when you truly know if this profession mm. is truly for you, you know, um, when, when you're not getting the work. And that's when I realized, oh, I actually genuinely do love this. And even if I don't get paid for it for the rest of my life, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. But the one thing that um, how I started to cope was first you have to go through the pain, the pain and, and, and of not knowing. But then when you start to let go and start to take control and just say, why do I do this? If money didn't exist, would I still wake up tomorrow and do this profession? The answer is absolutely, you know, with or without that. So that, that was brilliant to have that release. And go, okay, so what I need to do is figure out a way of how I can earn a living that won't cripple me in terms of my time, because a genuine actor, a, a, a regular, sorry, a normal act, job in actor's profession is working in a bar, being a waiter and stuff, which is great and it's commendable, and I've done those jobs, I've worked those jobs, but the downside of those jobs is it's 12, sometimes, 12 hour shifts, sometimes longer. You are dead when you get in, and you have literally no time to work on your craft, because the time you do have, you're that tired, you just don't want to, and the, the, 
the career as an actor is so unpredictable that you're like, there is a part of you that goes, oh, I, do I practice my craft or do I get those couple of extra hours sleep because I feel dead? So it, t- it was a lot of resistance. It took me a long while to accept that you can actually have more than one love. You can have multiple loves that give you multiple joy. Because in my head, I had it as if I did, if I did anything else, oh, I've quit. That means I've quit the acting and it means that I don't care about acting enough. Being a waiter and suffering, waiter, suffering, it's a hard job, it's minimum wage, I'm suffering, I'm working long hours to earn my right to be an actor so I have this big story to tell, oh yeah, I was just this poor, down and out, broke waiter who was just making rent, barely, barely surviving, then all of a sudden, because I stuck in, I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. I went, what else do I love? And it took me years to get to this point, years, um, almost 10 years before my career started to, to go again, started to move again. There was a crazy 10 year gap. Um, and it was through that where, where I, so much resistance. No, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Cause everyone was saying you should be coaching. You should be doing this. I was like, no, because I don't, I don't have a plan B cause it distracts you from plan A. Hmm. That's not true either. There's a certain bit of truth in that, but the, the truth is, is look at everyone around us who we see as successful and we look up to, in my profession, for example, someone like off the top of my head, um, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, he's an actor, but he was a wrestler. He has a tequila company. He has shares in it. They do so many different things. He has a nutrition company. You can have more than one love in your life. It doesn't mean that it's going to detract you from your number one love, which for me is acting. It doesn't mean that... Um, you've given up on that dream. It just means you're allowing that dream to live longer because you found something else that gives you joy and another source of income that f- gives you the freedom, gives me the freedom to be here, gives me the freedom to write those things behind me and, and gives me the freedom to write it. So that's how I learned how to cope. After the resistance and then the depression, going, no, no, I'm not doing it. Even with the writing, I was like, no, I'm an actor. Actors don't write. Actors don't direct, they don't produce, they just focus on, I'm an actor, I'm not doing any of that. That was laziness and fear talking. That was me giving myself the great excuse to go, oh, well, I didn't get the auditions, that's why I didn't get the jobs as an actor. That's the worst thing you can ever do, because at the end of the day, you are 100% responsible for your own happiness. If you really want to do something, you'll find a way. There's not one single way of doing it, but if you don't want to do it, you'll make an excuse. And for years, I made excuses. I'm an actor. I'm not doing that. No, I'm not going to coach because I, I enjoy, yeah, I enjoy training and, and helping people, but I don't want it to be a profession because it'll take away from my acting. But any young actor out there or anyone who's trying to be a writer or whatever it is, my advice to you is this. You can have more than one love and your second love may just give you the freedom to never, ever give up on your first love. And for me, I'm a, I'm a coach. I do a lot of uh, mental coaching, acting coaching, uh, personal training, that kind of coaching. Uh, I've developed um, a company and a brand called Call, which stands for the key of life. We'll talk about that in a bit if you want to. Um, and that has developed into its own beautiful thing. And the irony is I've met so many more people through this mm-hmm. who are also in my industry and it's given me much more life experience. Instead of being insular, acting, 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 I've got all this life experience now. And you can't be a great ex- artist without life experience, without getting out there. So that's, that's how I cope. You've got to find something that you love to do mm-hmm. that will give you an income, that will give you the freedom to continue doing the other thing. So like, I'm in a position now where if I never get paid for acting ever again in my life, Number one, I'll still be doing it till the day I die. I'll still be writing till the day I die. And I'll still be able to live a happy, lovely life, pay my bills. And that's, that's, that's how, you, how I cope with those, those down times. And that's what I wish for everybody in the world to find their, their thing. I think that's an, that's an excellent response. Uh, I, probably the best response I've ever received with that question. Because usually... I living in LA, I met quite a few aspiring actors and they would usually come there from Midwest or somewhere 
you know, and they would give themselves about five years to make it. They would have a certain amount of savings. And if they didn't make it, and I've seen this because I lived in LA for about nine years, yeah. I've seen them come and go because yeah. you, they pretty much, they put their eggs in that basket and then they would, like you're saying, you know, just do bartending or waitressing. <laughs> and that does not, that cannot pay the rent wow. in LA. Like, it doesn't matter where you live. It's so expensive. So I think it's great that you mentioned that not have a plan A or plan B. Have a plan A and a B and a C. And they all work together to let yeah. that, you know, your acting work yeah. for you. And, and that's it. And, and this is the thing. There's no such thing as making it. It yeah. doesn't exist. You know, um, there's a wonderful book I'm reading at the moment. Um, it's John Wood Wooden his memoirs he was a famous uh, basketball coach and um, I, I posted something on Instagram about it today like his quote from the book so I'm going to rehash it now but it, it was about um, learn as if you were immortal and live as if you were going to die tomorrow mm -hmm. basically it's about being a lifelong learner so you should continually be, um, like I said this year in, when I hit 40s I started jujitsu I started the piano. I've got my grade one piano exam coming up. Um, th those two things. And I've just started doing a singing course because I did a couple of musicals when I was younger. Never a great singer, but it's something that gives me joy and it releases something else out of me. All these crazy, crazy things. So you should always want to be this, this lifelong learner and this curiosity. And there's no such thing as making it. You, you only learn. If you do that, if you do that, you just you're not in it for the right reasons, you know. You're not you're, you're not in the profession, you know. There's two things: you can have a profession or a career, or you can have the life. I chose the life of an actor. The life, as bougie as that sounds, the life of an artist. There is no expiry date on that. That expires when I expire, whether I'm working or not, whether I'm getting paid or not. Like, there's no such thing as making it. There's just doing it. You just do it. And when you're younger, because I had all those same things as well. Oh, if I haven't hit this mark by the age of 25 or 35, whatever it was. And when I get to that age, it was a huge disappointment. It was too much, too much pressure. I was taking away the love of, of doing it. It was just completely ruining it. It became a job then. You know, it became, oh, God, I've got to do it because I've got to pay my bills. No. Remember, you used to pay to go to amateur dramatics classes. You used to pay for the experience to act. So what's changed? Why has that changed? Why has that suddenly like become like, oh, no, I'm not doing it? If it's, it's, it's crazy the way, way it changed. So for all those who have got like a timeline, or if I don't make it, get rid of that timeline. Figure out a way to make money that makes you happy. You'll never have to quit on your dream. You'll never have to stop doing it. It'll give you great joy till the day you die when you're not busy behind or in front of the camera what do you do for fun what are some of your hobbies jujitsu <laughs> as your husband well knows because uh, for those of you who don't know Declan <laughs> and his husband kicks my butt at ju I'm, I'm brand new to jujitsu uh, okay. but I love it I've got my little I hear you say that yeah, I've got my little one stripe on my white belt, but again, lifelong learner. It's um, it's an unbelievably beautiful, humbling discipline, and Declan is the norm in terms of you know the ethos and and people's personalities within that discipline. He's an unbelievable human being, but the majority of people who practice jujitsu are they. I don't know what it is. It's just this discipline. This. It, it, it's so humbling when someone who weighs five stone less than you can tie you up in a knot and make you tap out. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's exhilarating. So that gives me a lot of freedom um, and, and release and a sense of pride and humility. And that's very important for anyone in life. There's a fine line between confidence and arrogance. You need the confidence, but you need something like jujitsu to keep your feet on the ground, to stop you from, because we're all only human, you know, we, we will step over there, we can be dicks sometimes, you know, um, but, but what jiu-jitsu gives you is an awareness, so you'll, you'll be aware, if you're being a dick, 
or, oh, I'm beating a dick, you know, which is, it's nice to, and awareness is such a, a beautiful human quality to know, because then you can, you can stop it, like, immediately. It doesn't, it doesn't um, fester for a long period of time. So that is, like, and again, guys, have multiple hobbies. I went through a phase in my life where I was like, no, all I can do is acting. Acting, lift weights to look good so I can look good on screen. It was too insular. I was a, a proper LA dude with, with I'd, I'd literally shut off my entire personality, yeah. which is the worst thing you can do. And then eventually, as you can see behind me, it all started to come back. So jujitsu, I'm always looking for new things to do, but yeah, that's going to be a lifelong thing. Off. I could see the arms. I could see the muscles in the arms. I, the hey. <laughs> but, um, but so jujitsu, and then a year ago, I took up the piano. I'll just swizzle this round so you can see my little, so there's my little mic and piano there. Oh, um, okay. And again, I, I just started fiddling on YouTube, and then I went, no, I want to do this properly. So I got, because you should always good coaches are invaluable you know co even coaches need coaches it doesn't matter what you do so this is what another thing about jiu-jitsu so you'll have a, a master black belt who's a world champion someone like carlos who coaches at our club he still has his coaches he still has a humility and humbleness to go to his coaches and learn it doesn't matter what level you get to always stay humble and always be hungry to learn there was this wonderful um, thing that this, I can't remember his name, but this world famous ju um, judo master, famous throughout the world, Declan will probably know who it is. Um, he revolutionized judo basically. And when he died, one of his um, wishes was he wanted to be buried with his white belt to symbolize that oh. he's starting again. He's beginning again, and he's going to continue that, that journey of growing and learning. So the piano, I've got my grade one exams coming up. I was meant to have already sat it, but because of quarantine and lockdown, um, I have to wait. I probably might have to do it online. Um, obviously, I love to train. I love calisthenics, uh, boxing, Thai boxing. I love to, to have a little sing, even though I'm not very... And this is another thing. It doesn't matter if you're not good at anything. Okay. Everybody's rubbish when they first start something. But if it gives you joy, if you're so, then do it. Forget about everything else. Do you know, if, if you're too, like, shy to do it in public, like, I, I sing at home. I, like, sometimes I even hire a studio to, so no one can hear me and I can have the freedom to scream and I'll just freaking sing. Um, and reading, prolific reader, obviously writing and, and things like that are part of my profession, but that still is, is a hobby because... The definition of being a professional is you get paid for what you do, right? So at the moment, I'm not getting paid to write. So it's a hobby, right? Uh, I, and I love to do it. So yeah, lots of things, lots of things. <laughs> that, that, that's good. You're keeping busy. <laughs> now you you mentioned well, the most important. I like to drink whiskey. Cheers. <laughs> that's not as I thought. Is it's really smooth. So I guess if you have good whiskey, then it's 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 a good thing big difference you don't get the hangover it gives you that nice warm soothing feeling down the throat and you just sip it you just take your time i never thought in a month of sundays 20 years ago that i'd be sat drinking whiskey but again you develop taste just be open to everything that's that's what i say again all you young actors or whoever's watching this whatever it is just be open take take a shot take a little risk because you never know what beauty can come from that and even your hardships you're going to learn if you if you have that mindset the hardships are the things that you learn the most from they are so they end up being so beautiful they won't be at the time but eventually when you can look back at it you be you're like oh my god do you know what i hated that at the time but i'm so so thankful that that happened to me because i wouldn't have this understanding or, or this, this quality of life that I have right now. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. So embrace those hardships and, and face them head on. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like I was saying, you had lived in several different places. You mentioned L.A. as one of them. Um, is hope for you a place or a feeling? Describe that place or describe that feeling. 
Wow, um, it's that's a freaking great question. Um, it's you asked some really awesome questions, by the way. Like I've done a lot of interviews in in my little time, and and this is by far my favorite interview. So thank you. Um, because again, I like to be. I like thought provoking questions. I like questions that are going to make me think. Are going to challenge me. Um, so yeah, for me, like. You see a lot of people, you know, traveling the world and stuff to find themselves. When you're younger, I think it's very important to travel and experience different cultures and, and get a bit more of a, a worldly view. But um, if, if you're traveling to find yourself, you are looking in the wrong places. And the only way you can realize that is through time and experience. You're not going to realize that at 20. Um, I'm freaking lucky that I realize that in my late thirties, you know, um, home and happiness comes from within. You are as, as cheesy as that sounds. I love Eckhart Tolle, the power of now and stillness. Um, but you are a hundred percent responsible for your own happiness. And if you are unhappy and, and you go, I'm going to travel because I'm unhappy and I want to find myself, you're traveling for the wrong reasons because no matter where you go, that feeling that you have that made you leave in the first place is always going to be there because it's in you. It isn't, you're not going to find that happiness or you're not going to find yourself in LA or New York or wherever you deem the most beautiful place. You could be sat in the middle of paradise and still feel like the world is ending. It comes from within. So for me, it's, it's a feeling. It's being, a, being appreciative and grateful for the present, being able to be aware of your humanity and, and what is beautiful and what you have in life and being able to sit in a cardboard box and be able to go, do you know what? I'm in a cardboard box, but I'm all right. Or be, whether you're in a $20 million mansion in, in Malibu Beach. Um, so for me, it's... it's um, home is is a feeling it come it comes from you it comes from inside but also when it comes to a place for me personally and again everyone's different like you said i've lived everywhere it it has to have a history a rich history and um like i'm my parents are indian i was born and brought up in england but that that's my heritage india has a beautiful rich history England, though, as well, like has an incredibly beautiful, rich history, and literature literally saved my life. That is, that's not even an exaggeration. Thomas Hardy, um, Charles Dickens, Chaucer, Oscar Wilde—all these, all these wonderful, inventive people. George Eliot. They, I could, I could go on and on. These, these beautiful writers and and four thinkers saved my life so yeah that that history um so it's it's both hmm this is a great i mean i knew you could handle it you know after listening to a few of your motivational messages and even with our conversation today i just had to ask you this question yeah. do you believe more in faith or that we are creators of our own destiny because we are governed by free will fate as in faith F or faith f-a-t-e yes. um no um i it was confucius said it better than me he said the man who thinks he can and the man who thinks he cannot are both usually right so i believe we are creators of our own destiny I believe that you create your own fate. There are certain things that are out of your control, i.e. the coronavirus. Yeah. But you can still, if you, if you have a negative mindset, you're going to see it negatively. If you have a positive mindset, you're going to go, and it's all conditioning. You condition yourself, just like growing muscles, the mind, your mental, it, it's a muscle. If you don't use it, if you don't create what you want in there, it, it dies. It dies. Hence, if I stop, let's say I stopped reading and educate myself and, and being curious for a year and we had, had another interview, you'd be talking to a whole different human, you know, and it's the same as in a year, if I stopped training completely 
and started drinking this 24 hours a day and going to McDonald's and eating all this stuff, physically, you'd be sat in front of a whole different person in a year. The mind is exactly the same as the body. They both need to be fed. Um, what was that Indian proverb? There's, there's two people in there. There's, there's the, um, the angel and the wolf in your mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and both want feeding. Do you know what I mean? And you've got to make sure that you feed, feed the right element. Um, so, so for me, it's definitely your fate for me is a cop out. It's, it's all, oh, well, this is, this is just how it is for me. It's just a, a, a wonderful way of making an excuse for yourself. Cause look, look at some of the most inspirational humans on earth who've had nothing like, I can't remember that this is Australian guy who's a quadriplegic, who's a, a, a world's leading motivational speaker. The guy literally has no legs and no arms and he does everything. That's a mindset. Yeah. Anyone who believes in fate could go, well, this is my fate. I, I, I'm, and he is well within his right to sit there and go, the world and fate dealt me a bad hand. Man, look at me. I can't do anything. But the, the irony is he, do, he does even more than I do. And I'm a full, healthy, fully. And, and it's people like that that I look to and I applaud. I'm like that. I, I want to be like you. I want, I want to be like you. And that is your own belief system. That comes from you. You know, whatever cards you get dealt with, you can't, you can't control that. But what you can control is how you react to that and what you do with those cards. That's all we can do. So I am, like, like I told you, I went through that phase where I was like, the world is against me. It's not in my fate. It's just not meant to be. So back then, I probably did believe in it. But now I'm like, nah, whatever the world throws at me, it's throwing at me for a reason. I can either use it and learn from it, or I can use it as an excuse and wallow in self-pity. So, nope, you're, you're in control of your own destiny. One million, billion, trillion percent. <laughs> you know, because I believe that the creator creates our destinies, and it's up to us to decide whether or not we want to walk in them. And yeah. you, my friend, you're certainly walking into your destiny. Yeah, it was, um, there's, there's a wonderful speaker called Les Brown. And um, oh, yeah, he, said, he, he said something, wonder, he says many wonderful things, but one of his quotes, um, if you do what is hard, your life's going to be easy. But if you do what is easy, your life's going to be hard. Mm. So they're the choices, choices we've got. Um, and, and it is, you have a choice. We all have those choices, you know, and some more than others. Like, I'm in a very privileged position, even, even coming from that town in Middlesbrough. If you had a roof over your head and food in your belly, you were still richer than 95%. You were in the top 5%. I read this in a service survey. You were still in the top 5% wealthiest people on earth. Hmm. Do you know, and, and that blew my mind I was like why am I complaining and then you look at like you know Ethiopia and all the you know people who are fleeing here from those countries where the families are getting massacred and you've just got to think oh my god I mean it's all relative you know you, you, your problems are relative to where you are and in in your current situation but you've got to you've got to expand you've got to get out of that mindset and go shit man like my fiance left me shit that's that's awful, but why did that happen? Okay, cool. Let's let's figure that out. Life is a beautiful thing, and I'd rather have that happen to me than not not love at all. She's an unbelievable human being, and I wish her all the luck in the world. Do you know, it, it's just things at the time that, that don't happen. It, it just it wasn't meant to be. But you learn. You can either use that and go, oh, love. I'm not going to love anyone again. This is shit, you know, fuck you, fuck off. Like, I'm going to use everybody and just, like, get what I want. Or you can look at it the way I do, and that's thanks to my Victorian literature friends, where it's like, how lucky am I to feel so passionately? Even though it stings and I'm in immense pain, that, like, I feel so alive from that. Obviously, I'd love it to be the other, other end, the happiness and the, the joy. I was going to ask, um, so are you single now and are you... Oh, no, no, I've, I've been seeing a lovely, lovely woman for 
the last four months. She's she's ama- and again that's that's what I mean. Be open to love. How, she's awesome. So well, the quarantine is you know it's lifted for the, for you know for the most part. How are you guys communicating during the quarantine? That's a great question. So I met her before quarantine back in November last year. So we were dating for quite a while, and and it got like because because we're both at a certain age now. You know, obviously I don't want to. Because a woman's age is a secret. Yeah. I don't care. Like, Never like say a woman's age. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah. So when it all happened, we were very, very sensible, um, and and basically we we both went look. We'll face. So we advert like a bit like this. So we were having dates on online, and for even though she only lives like twenty minutes away from me. We stayed away for six weeks. We didn't see each other. And she was the first person I had contact with in, in six weeks. Like, I've had no other human contact. Even what, are we in week nine now? Still, she's the only person I've had any other human contact with. All my coaching and stuff I'm doing online like this via Zoom. Uh-huh. Um, but if you, you make the effort, if someone is worth the effort, you make the effort. And, and again, everything's a discipline. So you want to get good at something, you discipline yourself to make a plan, make a routine and, and stick to that routine. So I was like, oh, this is, this is all brand new to me and her. So like as in a new relationship. So this is going to be tough, but I know I really like her. So I want to show her that. Um, Why will it be tough? Or because you won't be able to see each other for six weeks. So <laughs> as in the quarantine. And that was what was that was what was tough not the actual so so because obviously when something's brand new and fresh you want to be with each other all the time when you get excited you want to go on dates and you want to do this and that that was all taken away so I was like okay and I'm not like even though it seems it like this in interviews and stuff because when I'm taught but when it comes to general chit chat I'm quite like oh yeah what have you been up to today oh cool and then after about five minutes, I'm not good on the phone. I'm like, all right, um, I'll speak to you tomorrow. Bye. So it can seem so. I, I'm just not like good at talking on the phone and things. But I made, I was like, look, I'm going to make the effort and I'm going to stay on there for as long as I can because I want her to know that she's, she's special to me. So we organized online dates and quiz quizzes and things like that. Um, and it's just, I, I think it's brilliant because things like that, when they test you, you you know you, you kind of see a side of that person that he, that that makes you like them even more, and that's it. So I think through this quarantine, our relationship is stronger than it would have been if yeah. there was no quarantine. Because you take that we take things for granted so much. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Going to a nice bar, going to the cinema, or let's go for Sunday lunch, or let's go and grab a coffee from our favorite coffee shop and go for a walk along the river. All that's taken away and you have to become inventive. But now we're still like, we've both been very, very careful and we'll just see each other like three days a week. So it'll be a, a full weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, and because and, we want like, the world's going through a tough time at the moment and I, I want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And she's yeah. exactly the same, you know. Um, yeah. So that's, that's yeah. pretty much it. And reading books. You know, read read books like learn about if there's something weird going on in your head. There's this when we're, we're not the first people who've experienced it. There's millions, thousands of people, hundreds of years old. I read books from Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, all these wonderful Plato, Socrates, all these incredible ph- philosophers who and and I'm like, oh my god, you lived hundreds and thousands of years ago, but all the the human problems. The human psyche is still the same. So we can learn from these people. I'm like, oh my God. So I just devour though. There's, I'm, I'm about to start Carl Jung. I don't even know whether I pronounce that properly. Um, his uh, Memories, Dreams and Reflections book. Because wow. it's, just, it's just so freaking fascinating. And it allows me, like I'm not a clever guy. I'm a, I may sound clever, but it's all these dudes behind me. It's like, it, it, none of these words are my own words. The passion is my own. The, the, the zest for life is my own, but it's being fed by those dudes behind me. You know, all those guys, they're my mates. There's hun- I've got hundreds and thousands of mentors up there 
You know, they don't have to be physical mentors. You can find them in books. So, well, so yeah. And you know what, too? Like, when I met, I think I'd mentioned this, but when I met my husband, um, I met him on holidays. I came here, I met him at the pub, you know, had to go back home. And so, thankfully, there's WhatsApp, but that was yeah. what we used to communicate. And it is true, you learn not to take each other for granted. Yeah. And we would schedule a time and... I would make sure that I'm home at this time. And it was a good feeling. And we would always check in with each other every day. So even though we weren't physically seen or touching each other, the connection was definitely there. And I feel that to some degree, you learn to appreciate the person more. And if you yeah. really care about that person, then you're able to put up with not seeing them for long periods of time. Exactly. And he's a dude, man. Like, he's such a good guy. Like, I, from the first day I rolled with him, I was just like, I really like you, dude. Like, or, 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 for those of you who don't know what rolled is, jujitsu, it's not like, yeah, it's, it's like rolled is like when you spar, you have a roll. So that's, that's what that is. Um, not he's, he's a, he's a, and the no, fact that he's, continually learning like he's learning how to edit he's doing a, a law degree at the moment is that right yes yes and he just got his grades level one the highest that you can get so he's killing what a dude he freaking deserves it he's a dude man and, and hard work pays off like it really does discipline yeah. hard work and yeah. again having a great partner it's a team you know yeah. when, when you decide to there are sacrifices you have to make in terms of be, and, and but they're, they're not really sacrifices because if that person means something to you, you want to do it for them. You generally want to go. Do you know what? I know she loves this, so I'm going to do it. You know, it 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 may not be your thing, but then like there's lots of things I've learned that I didn't think was my thing, and I've I've done it because I know that she didn't, and I've loved it. So I'm like, oh my god, and that's it. He's a dude. No, you two are you yeah, two are cool. Like Skinny jeans, that wasn't his thing until I came along. And now that's all he wears. He throws, he threw all the baggy ones out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. Like beards and stuff. Like I, wa I wasn't particularly into that, but she likes it. So I'm like. That's the other thing. Oh. He didn't yeah. have a beard. And I said, you should grow a beard because I think you'd be so hot. And he yeah. said, uh, and then the next time I would see him on video, he started growing the beard. And by the time he came to visit me, he had like a full beard, and I was like, "Hi." <laughs> That's so cool. No, he's yeah. um, so, you know, well. you've said a lot, and um, just very, 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 very um, powerful, insightful information. Now, what advice would you give to a struggling actor or someone just starting out? Okay, right. Um, this, I'm going to try and do this quite concisely. This is um. This is a really difficult industry. Mm -hmm. So you can't do it for anyone else. You can't do it because you want to make it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Only get into it because you really like to act. And you've got to have the mindset that if I never get to do this ever, I'm still going to do it. Because you're only going to, you're, you're only going to face massive disappointments. If you want to be wealthy or famous or rich, I'm telling you, there's so many other ways that are way easier to do that. Get get a job in a, a very like well-respected business and work your way up the ladder. Become a, a reality TV star. All these things, you know. But if you want to be an actor, an actor essentially is an artist, a true actor. They're an artist. And you can become a businessman after that. You have to love, love it. And if money was no object... If you can still say, it, I'd still get up tomorrow and go to my improvisation class at seven o'clock on Melrose, which is one of the things I used to do when I was in LA. I'll drive from Liverpool when I was doing Hollyoaks because I wanted to um, keep working on my vocal um, and my accent work, my American accent and thing things, because it was still wasn't like I can do it. I'm I'm fine and comfortable with it now, but it's all work. I'd every weekend I'd drive back up to London to see my vocal coach and I'd I'd do my for one hour of dialect classes. I'd come up, drive to London from Liverpool, do my class, do my accent work, get my homework, drive back to Liverpool to be on set for five o'clock the next morning. Wow. 
you'll just do it. So any actors out there that are struggling, you're not really struggling. You, it, it's, it's a mindset. You're struggling because you, you're frustrating. You're desperate to get those jobs. You can't be desperate. It can be smelt a mile away. You have to find something else that gives you great joy in terms of fact, because finances are important. They give you a sense of freedom. That's what money is a great slave, but it's a poor master. So you have to figure out a way of earning an income that will give you the freedom to truly be an artist. I know in, in the olden days, it was like, oh, I suffer for, for my art and stuff. If the world has changed. You don't have to suffer for your art. You have to be disciplined for your art. So figure, figure that out. Figure out something else that you enjoy to do that will give you money. I've spoke about this earlier on. So that is sorted. Don't become amazing at that thing because if you become too good at that thing, you'll get tempted by the devil. He'll go, we'll give you millions of dollars to run our corporation and stuff. And then, then you're gone and then your dream's gone. But if that's what you really want to do, fair enough. So be great at your, your other passion, but don't be so great. Or if, if you are so great, just don't be tempted by the, do you know, okay, we're, we're going to, because then it becomes 24 hours. So get that thing. Once you get that in place, and I think for, for actors, the majority of actors I know, young actors, are very health conscious. My God, the fitness industry, being good at that is the biggest freedom you could ever get as an actor you know so become a coach you know but not like oh i'm gonna be if 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 fitness isn't your thing and you've never trained a day in your life you ain't gonna be able to compete with me or people who've done it like i i got the qualification for legal reasons but i'm I'm not being facetious here but the majority of people who are teaching me so good at the technical the theory and, and the exams to get the legal exam qualifications but I am like, and this is again not be. I'm I'm doing so much better than them because on the floor where it counts, I know so much more because I've done so much more. Yeah. Do you know, I, it, it, the exp. It's in the doing. You know, this is saying knowledge is power. Bullshit. Taking action on knowledge is power. You can have all the knowledge in the world up there, but if you don't actually take the steps to do anything with it, it's useless. It's worthless. You have to do action speaks louder than words. You have to action yourself. So if you're struggling out there, find something that you love that's going to earn you money and then carve your own way. No one's going to care about your career more than you do. Not your agent, even your family who love you more than, more than life itself, who want the best for you. The only person who's going to care the most about your, your passion, because the only person who truly is yourself. So you have to take 1 million percent control of that write, produce, direct, tell your stories, get out there. You can literally, on a mobile phone now, there's no excuses. You can make the, this, the most unbelievable films being made on mobile phones. You have no excuse. You can film yourself doing a monologue, singing a song. You can do all these things. You can start your own YouTube channel, Stephen Upple Films, website, all these things, there's no excuses. So if you're struggling out there, you're not really struggling. You're making an excuse saying, oh, the world isn't giving me my Hollywood, my £2 million job on Fast and the Furious 9. Mm -hmm. That's, that's when, when actors are thinking about struggling, that's what they're thinking. Oh, the world isn't giving me that £100,000 a week lead role on Game of Thrones. You are not struggling. So any of you struggling actors out there, You've got to really think, are you in it for the right reasons? And when, when you can figure that out and be, be comfortable in yourself, then you'll know whether this is for you or not. Great and advice, that. great advice. Now, before we go, I wanted to show a clip of your TV pilot, Damned. Let's take a look. He's claiming he's got an inside man. Who? In the guard. says is true. It's worth the risk. The country can't grow with the guard in place. Figured you felt the same. It's not going to bring her back, Tom! Oh, Claire, you follow. Stop right now! If you don't leave the guard, if you do, they come after you. It was orders, Tom. I'm a governor. Go. 
In 15 seconds or less, I want you to sum up what this show is all about in an American accent. <laughs> in an American accent. Well, I've had, I've had a lot of whiskey, so that's going to be quite hard. Uh, 15 <laughs> seconds, as well as you know that I can talk for a long, long time. So, uh, damned. The irony is it's, it's what's happening in the world right now. It's set in a dystopian future. And I'm going to come out of that now because I'm pissed. <laughs> I've had a full goblet. So basically what's happening at the moment with um, the world, the irony is we shot this early in 2019, end of 2018, 2019, um, before any of this happened. And Damned is set in a dystopian future. So it's set in the future where Britain has been wiped out. Um, so they've declared martial law and they've brought in this militant group, militant operative group called the Guard to restore Britain back to its former glory. My character, Tom, is one of the leaders of the Guard. He's one of the, like, the, the head, head men. Um, and he's disgusted. He believes in it. He's very patriotic. He loves his country. He wants to, he wants to see his wife and his children and everything flourish. But... Um, Five years in, six years in, he's disgusted in, in the way the politics are going and, and what's going on. So he defects. He, he escapes and you can't leave the guard. It, it became that. We, we were all ended up being prisoners of the system. You can't escape it, but he defects. He manages to escape by, with the help of his friend and starts to live um, just wherever he can without, with his wife and just wants to be free and figure it out. They eventually catch up with him. Um, and that's when shit, it's a fan. So it's, that's basically what it's about. And the irony is, which is so bizarre, it's, it's basically, it's as if the guy who wrote it is a bit of a clairvoyant because it's exactly what is happening right down. The world was locked down. You can't do anything. Everyone's living in like forests and woods. Like the world's being destroyed. There is no economy. There is no businesses. The, the derelict buildings that are left in and around the world have been taken over and, and it's like kill or be killed. And there's, I think in the trailer that you just showed, showed there, there's a bit where you, you can't, I, my character Tom says, you, you can't leave the guard or you don't leave the guard. It was a long time since I did it, so I can't remember the lines exact. You don't leave the guard. If you do, they come after you. And that's basically basically what it is it's and and i think um for me i don't think the writer had this in mind but um beyond therapy what is one of the films that i'm currently about to make my directorial debut on which i've written it's about Karl marx's theory that free, freedom is a false sense of ideology this is the longest 15 seconds of your life <laughs> sorry guys i don't um, I, I like details so Karl marx um Basically, he had this theory that um, freedom is a false sense of ideology. Basically, we're all in a system. So we all are, are, are taught that we're free. Oh, yeah, go on. But we still pay our taxes and da 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 So we're in a, a virtual pr prison. If you think about the Matrix, you know, when he unplugs himself and sees the world for the first time, that's basically what Karl Marx was saying. And the idea that you've got a choice, take the blue pill, take the red pill, you know, some people do, some people don't. And look at us all now. We don't truly know what's going on, but I'd rather, but still, even me with, with all the, the like, open-mindedness I have, I still abided by the rules. I said, what the government told me to do, I was like, yep, I'm not going out. I'll stay here, I'll do this. And, and, and they literally, basically clicked the fingers, told me stuff, and I went, yeah, okay. Like, it, it's true, I'm, I'm not doing it. So and that's basically what damned, damned for me personally, when I read the script, I was like, oh, wow, this is like, we all live in a, in a crazy prison and we never truly know. That's why I don't watch the news. I don't watch the news. I, I spend as little time as possible on Facebook and Instagram and social media and stuff like that because I, I go back to them. When I have a relapse, you know, like an alcoholic where 
like with, with this because we're addicted to our phones and I find myself doing this scrolling mm -hmm. oh, yes yeah I'm like that I'm like oh I get and I go straight back to my books that that for me is a relapse these things have become addictive and they you can use them for good or they can use you yeah. you know what I mean again like that money uh, saying that I said social media is a great slave but a poor master you know so you've got you've got a choice you're using it for greatness people who are going to watch your show even if it's one person they're gonna you're gonna change their lives and it's a great thing that you're doing so thumbs up to you thank you thank you that was by far the longest 15 seconds ever <laughs> i'm so sorry guys don't like 15 seconds no i need three hours yeah that's okay that's okay i mean and thank you so much again for um being a part of the inside job and being a part of the season finale really 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 appreciate it couldn't have had a better guest to close out the season thank you so much and to everyone out there thank you for continuing to watch and supporting the inside job. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you can see our behind the scene moments as well as bloopers. We'll have some great ones and a sneak peek at season two. As always, stay safe and God bless. Thank you guys.